In my lecture today, which I shall uh, divide into uh, three short parts, roughly of about 10 to 12 minutes each, I would like to speak to the issue of dialectics. The term dialectical materialism is fairly well known even today, one may say, and it is the correct term for the, to describe the world view of those who describe themselves as communists, especially if they belong to the organized left. One part of the term is easily recognized, namely materialism. People are very familiar with it. It continues to have some acceptance in academic and intellectual circles, at least as a pragmatic philosophical view. Because after all, materialism, whose fundamental principle is of the existence of an objective reality, independent of and prior to consciousness of thought, is a necessity for any kind of science to be meaningful. So you cannot really speak of science in any meaningful fashion without an underlying materialist, materialist stance or materialist attitude. Uh, if the world itself were merely the projection of thought, or our theories of the world were merely the result of our trying to describe it based on our perceptions, then of course there is no explanation for why science and technology are so successful. Successful in not only understanding the material world around us, but also being able to transform. So the success of science and technology presupposes that we are dealing with an objective reality, an objective world, because we can then also transform it. But the issue at hand that I would like to address is dialectics. And grasping this relationship between dialectics and materialism has been one of the great challenges of Marxist thought. In consolation, perhaps we can say that dialectics is a young science, that the dialectics in philosophy is still perhaps just out of its childhood. When we consider the other philosophical traditions and philosophical views that dominate the world and the thinking of uh, uh, people across the world, dialectics is a late comer. But nevertheless, this has uh, raised the serious issues, especially for uh, communist movements and left movements throughout the world. So I will speak to three, briefly to three issues. First, I want to talk about why dialectics is essential to a consistent view of materialism. It is quite simple as a matter of fact, but we often forget to remind ourselves of this very simple simplicity itself. Second, I will briefly indicate how dialectics is as fundamental in a philosophical sense to contemporary science as it is to materialism. There will not be time to go into detail, but I will just briefly indicate. Thirdly, I will very briefly talk about Engels' three laws of dialectics. How to go beyond these and try to illustrate with a few, a couple of brief examples from political economy what Engels meant by referring to the inner interconnection of the three laws of dialectics. So, what is dialectics? So, without going into a more complex uh, definition, as an introduction, we may say it is the worldview that recognizes as fundamental the perpetually changing, transformative nature of the world, 
both natural and social. The world is constantly changing. It is full of, uh, you know, transitions, as the philosophers may call it, especially uh, dialecticians. And uh, Engels puts it very well when he says, when we consider and reflect upon nature at large, or the history of mankind, or our own intellectual activity, notice that he covers all three. He covers uh, the study of nature, he covers the study of society, or the process of human thought, human thinking. He says, at first we see the picture of an endless entanglement of relations and reactions, permutations and combinations in which nothing remains what, where and as it was, but everything moves, changes, comes into being and passes away. So this uh, very beautiful passage is actually little noticed sometimes by comrade. It comes from a very well-known text, Socialism, Utopian and Scientific. But unless you are looking to learn dialectics, very often these remarks go unnoticed. So he talks about how from the ancient Greeks this was very much uh, noticed by uh, thinkers. Of course, outside of Europe, Buddhism is one of the philosophical traditions known for its recourse to dialectics. Recognition of the impermanence of existence of all was fundamental to Buddhism. According to one of the suttas, immediately after the Buddha's very first sermon, one disciple is said to have explained, whatever has the nature of arising has the nature of cessation. So it's very beautifully put, goes to the very heart of the starting point of dialectics. Let us not, however, be overconfident and assume that this part is entirely obvious. As students of biology will tell you, the problem of aging, which of course is the transition towards eventual cessation, is a subject even today of scientific research. And in what manner does it affect different parts of the animal and plant kingdom, how it different, affects different species, even today is a subject of study. So, the point to make here is, motion and change are as fundamental to the world as objective reality. So, something like dialectics, if you could call it by another name, whatever it was, that it did not make room within materialism for the idea of change, transformation, being born and dying, then of course this materialism has a very problematic uh, issue. So what do we mean by saying something comes into existence? We say objective reality, we say independent of consciousness, but we have to also account in materialism for the fact that something comes to be. So, but then when you say something comes to be, when do you say it is actually in existence? So the external objective world, independent of human consciousness, is not something that we have to see it as part of a process. We may also have similar uh, uh, situations in a wide variety of fields. So, so it is not, we are not talking of a particular discipline, we are not talking only of nature, but as Engel said, we are talking about nature, society and the process of consciousness. The, once we raise the question of change and transformation, or more generally motion, as we would call it, then there is a question of the nature of motion. Is motion something external to matter? As J.D. Bernard pointed out, one of the great merits of Newton was to go beyond Aristotle. From Aristotle, the received view 
was that motion was the result of overcoming friction. The first law of Newton, which all of you are familiar with or should be, says very clearly that motion is an intrinsic property of matter. It dealt only with motion in flat space. It dealt only with ordinary classical motion. But at the next level, when we eventually came to the theory of relativity, we saw that matter itself, the motion of matter, was uh, in uh, sort of uh, inseparable or indistinguishable from the gravitational aspect of uh, matter itself. So it is important, therefore, to have this in view. In the social sciences, if you did not account for motion, if you did not uh, account for uh, transformation, it opens the way to all kinds of psychologism. And this was something that Marx, of course, was very quick to note in the context of uh, his critique of Feuerbach. Finally, I think a dialectics is important to materialism for reasons that I may, I maybe I will not go into in great detail, but uh, which is the fact that it gives the materialism a much more rigorous, self-contained formulation. See, you cannot simply, if you are taking a worldview, if you are taking a philosophical view of the world, uh, in that worldview, you cannot simply say matter and motion, and then the subject is over there. That's not possible. So you have what are called different categories. These are philosophical concepts. And these are like chance and necessity, possibility, or you have uh, form and content, uh, appearance and essence. Where do such categories come from and how will they arise in a systematic way? And this is something that really comes only with uh, dialectics. So, uh, with this, I hope to have made the point to you that materialism is all very well, but accounting for motion and change, for transformation, accounting for the fact that objective reality itself is changing and in transformation, and also eventually accounting for the correct way to think about it and to learn about it requires something more than materialism can provide. By itself, what materialism was historically as a uh, philosophical tradition. So it is dialectics. And it was the uh, dialectics, of course, had an uh, independent uh, uh, development and independent uh, history. But in the work of Marx and Engels, there began the transformation of dialectical materialism, not simply as two aspects of uh, philosophic or two philosophical traditions that were joined together externally, so to speak, but that came together in an internal unity. So if you go back in history, like Buddhist dialectics, etc., the ancient dialectics was always skeptical, you know. Zeno's paradox, which is one of the uh, great contributions to dialectics, ends with saying that there is no such thing as motion. So, you know, so it ends in skepticism. For Buddha, it was the question, don't ask deep questions about existence. You know, so that was uh, the Buddha's reaction from his dialectical view. So, a non-skeptical view of dialectics, a positive view of dialectics is a modern uh, phenomenon. And, but it is with Marx and Engels in their internal unity of dialectics and materialism that you realize that one, neither of the two is separable from the other. So, in uh, the philosophy, let me turn to making some remarks about contemporary science and uh, dialectics. One 
thing, of course, is, as uh, Lenin was the first to remark, uh, and Marx, of course, also in his own way, Marx and Engels noted it, the work of science is instinctively materialist, that I have already said. But Marx and Engels were one of the first to point out that the work of science is also instinctively dialectical. It's not simply dialectical in the sense that our theories of science are changing, but that, as Lenin was later to explain uh, very simply but very elegantly, it is because of our exploration of nature, our constant overcoming different layers, so to speak, or different going deeper into the structure of the natural world, that our theories also change, our scientific theories also change. So, well, before we heard of Thomas Kuhn, you know, Lenin and uh, it was followed by Christopher Quart, Cordwell, etc., had a fairly, I must say, the outline, if you wish, or even more, of a materialist understanding of the theory of scientific revolution. So, change, transformation, etc., are now routine even in the physical sciences. So, in the physical sciences, cosmology was a discipline which was simply about, uh, you know, it uh, was uh, very speculative. Uh, today, cosmology is uh, partly even an experimental science, though theory plays a very important part of it. So, I will not go into uh, elaborating uh, much more in uh, detail, uh, and uh, uh, I would refer you, if you look at the printed version of this, uh, to an earlier article where uh, I have described at length uh, the dialectical uh, dimension of contemporary science. But at the same time, in the history of dialectics, science and the advance of science has produced some very important challenges and that have been fortunately and partly unfortunately the part of the history of dialectics and also its implications for the left and communist movement. So one thing is, where is dialectics most clearly visible? And it is not very surprising that it is in human affairs. Perhaps dialectics is readily can be illustrated. If you think, therefore, however, when it comes to human affairs or the study of society, ideology plays such a confusing role that perhaps intermediate between the physical or mathematical sciences and the study of human society, the exemplar for the study of dialectics is biology. So, biology, that was realized by Hegel himself, that was realized by Marx and Engels when Darwin's Origin of Species was uh, published. Uh, Engels stood in queue to get one of the last copies, and uh, Marx, having read it, explained, uh, exclaimed, "You know, uh, the proof of our theories in the natural sciences of our time." So Marx wrote to Darwin, asking him to write a preface or permission to dedicate the second edition of Capital uh, to him. Uh, the letter can be seen on the website Charles Darwin online. Unfortunately, there is no record of uh, uh, Darwin's reply. Darwin was uh, very, uh, oh, let us say frankly, a bit of a coward even on these matters, didn't want public controversy, though his own personal views was certainly not religious of any kind. So then, the trouble with uh, by the study of biology was that the great powerhouse of dialectical thought for 70 years was the Soviet Union. And unfortunately, the history of science in the Soviet Union 
was marked by great misunderstanding and controversy on the questions of biology. So the Soviet uh, scientists and philosophers tried extremely hard to understand uh, uh, dialectics in the context of physical and mathematical sciences. And it is only in recent times, almost 80 years, 90 years after their first attempt, uh, well, one must say a hundred years, a centenary uh, of their attempt, that we have the glimmerings of what is a dialectical view in mathematics. Engels, of course, made uh, well, some very important obvious remarks, like for instance, if you take numbers, they specify isolated points. No, it is like, like you have one number, another number, you have a relation, you have 2 plus 2 equal to 4, that is simply there. However, if you write it as x plus 2 equal to 4, that becomes an equation. And uh, uh, one uh, very uh, fine uh, mathematician called uh, Bell, I forget his first name, uh, has uh, in fact uh, started talking about a dialectical logic in this uh, context. So mathematics and physics are uh, very difficult from the point of view of uh, dialectics. And uh, so uh, we unfortunately today have a situation where we understand a great deal about dialectics from the context of uh, social sciences and political economy, but from the view of the natural sciences, there remains a great deal to be done. But, uh, but I would like to, how much more time do you have? 20 minutes more. Oh, no, no, that's fine. So let me say something more about uh, what dialectics uh, is uh, why dialectics is uh, important and uh, uh, then I would like to turn to uh, I would like to turn to illustrating uh, uh, some of the why I uh, or rather what is the reason or uh, both the reason and why uh, as a movement uh, in this country, we should also be uh, interest, uh, keenly aware of uh, dialectics. So let me turn uh, at this point, uh, but before I uh, uh, shift uh, to the next subject, let me say that the challenge from mathematics for dialectics has been particularly uh, important. So mathematics in its effort to understand the calculus, continuous motion and all those kinds of things, after a work of a century and a half came to the conclusion at the beginning of the 20th century that there is no such thing as continuous motion and the only thing was that it was a jump so to speak, this continuous jumps, which was motion, and this is how our, our illusion thought of it as continuous mo uh, movement. This was a blow, and Bertrand Russell, the uh, great, uh, I must say, uh, he has a very progressive reputation politically, but philosophically, he was an implacable enemy of dialectical materialism. So he said, uh, Hegel, you know, who started dialectics, had the whole thing wrong, you know. There is no such thing. So he said it very beautifully, but and Russell. He said, there is no such thing as a state of change. All you have is a change of state. So meaning, it can, things jump. There is no state of change where things are changing. But fundamental to the dialectical view of motion is that motion is a contradiction. So when you say something is in motion, a thing is in motion, the uh, classic uh, dialectical understanding 
is that it is and it is not there at the same time. Now, of course, this is very, uh, you know, a point you can defend in words and philosophically. But to convert it into mathematics has proved impossible for 70 years. It's only in the last 30 years that one part of the story has been changed. So now you can talk of a, a state of change in the sense of the way you do calculus. It's a new way of doing calculus, gives the same results, but it is not found in Mingus. Is that they lived at a time when uh, Hegel's ideas were very much around, very current. So they wrote things and said things, uh, uh, commented or you know, uh, modified uh, Hegel, what they learned from Hegel in suitable ways, very often without explicitly uh, acknowledging, uh, acknowledging meaning spell, spelling it out because it came automatically and they were just writing and they were uh, exploring new ground. So that's one part of it and that is why uh, Marx famously is supposed to have said that he would like to put down the essence of dialectics on a simple sheet of paper. Unfortunately, he never did. And, uh, you know, much to our regret even today. And uh, so that was one thing. The, uh, how did they overcome it? You can see it especially in the development of productive forces. The way Marx and Engels consider productive forces, the way they consider constant capital, there I think you can really see the way uh, they integrated practice. The idea that fixed capital, constant capital is congealed labor, you know, uh, and the, it is absolutely fundamental to the contradiction of uh, the crisis of capitalist society uh, expressed through the falling rate of profit, etc. So, so they, did, they did it in practice. Uh, you will see in uh, uh, Lenin's philosophical notebooks when he uh, studies the third part of uh, Hegel's science of logic, he can see how to use it. But after that, of course, you know, uh, there was not uh, the occasion for uh, Lenin to expound on that. Uh, regrettably, in the history of dialectics, the rigor of uh, Marx in that uh, volume called the Brunneries, because basically a huge collection of notes prepared over one to one and a half years, and these are the working notes of capital. Capital is a presentation made so that people can understand. His first version, he wrote something and Engel said nobody would understand the word. So he, he wrote capital and he explained it, you know. But the working, how he reached the argument, making sure every step of the argument is logical and rigorous, logic in the dialectical sense is something in the Grunneries. Unfortunately, uh, the tradition of following this kind of argumentation is uh, very weak. And so that is why I think uh, I wanted to say that uh, the remarks that Lenin made on practice in the context of Hegel have not been carried forward in the manner uh, that they should have been. So, Grunneries, the role of labor, the role of labor in capital, and uh, these are the places where we should uh, start. Some of the Soviet psychologists were aware of this, like Vygotsky, but uh, the tradition of uh, doing what uh, Lenin said, Marx has left, did not give us a logic with a capital L, but he gave us with a logic with a small L in capital. We must do it in other areas of thought. That I think needs to be carried forward.